Okay. I'm going to, let me start by making some remarks which are directed not so much at those of you who are here today as to those who will be watching this on YouTube, maybe some years in the future. Over the last four years or so, I have posted a series of lectures on YouTube, four series in all. All but the first were recorded at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, before a small group of people by a camcorder and then uploaded to YouTube. And I was planning to do the same thing with these Hume lectures when the coronavirus hit. And I spent the last five sessions of the course I was teaching at UNC teaching by Zoom. And now I'm delivering these by Zoom. Uh, I say this because some people watching this may come to it years from now when the coronavirus pandemic is just a memory. But of course, for those of us who are living through it, it has totally transformed our lives. My wife and I are living in a retirement community essentially in quarantine. We've been quarantined for the last six, six weeks. One might wonder, since the world is coming apart, 100,000 people very soon will have died as a result of this virus. The, the economy is going into a free fall not seen since the Great Depression. So the question might be asked, in face of this, why am I delivering a series of lectures on Hume's theory of knowledge? And I think the best answer I can give is one that I find in one of my favorite philosophical works, the preface to Zoran Kierkegaard's Philosophical Fragments. Let me just read you what Kierkegaard has to say. He's talking, of course, not about my lectures, but about his book. He says, when Philip threatened to lay siege to the city of Corinth and all its inhabitants hastily bestirred themselves in defense, some polishing weapons, some gathering stones, some repairing the walls. Diogenes, seeing all this, hurriedly folded his mantle about him and began to roll his tub zealously back and forth through the streets. When he was asked why he did this, he replied that he wished to be busy like all the rest and rolled his tub lest he should be thought the only idler among so many industrious citizens. Kierkegaard remarks, such conduct is at any rate not sophistical if Aristotle is right in describing sophistry as the art of making money. So you can think of that as the reason why I am giving these lectures. I am in the face of this crisis rolling my tub up and down the street so that people won't think I'm an idler. With these lectures, I bring to a close a project which was launched 69 years ago. That seems hard to believe, but there it is. In the fall of 1951, I was a young 17-year-old sophomore at Harvard, back in the days when it was very easy to get into Harvard, by the way. And that semester, in the semester of the fall of 51, I took a course on Hume's Treatise of Human Nature. It was taught by a, one of the young Turks in the philosophy department, a bright but rather difficult man named Henry David Aiken. 18 months later, I was a senior, and my last semester at Harvard, I took the great course on the Critique of Pure Reason, taught by the grand old man of the department, Clarence Irving Lewis. That May, I sat the general examinations which were given to all of the majors in the philosophy department. And one of the questions was a pretty straightforward compare and contrast question about the theories of human knowledge of Hume and Kant. I figured since I had had Aiken's course on Hume and Lewis's course on Kant, I would take that question. So I took it and I started to write. I knew what they wanted, of course. What they wanted was a story about Hume, the great skeptic who called into question the validity of the causal maxim, and Kant who rode to its rescue with his transcendental philosophy in the transcendental analytic. But as I started writing my answer, I realized that I didn't think that was quite the correct story. I thought that Hume and Kant turned out to have much more similar philosophical positions than one might imagine, even though they came from totally different philosophical traditions and wrote in a totally different style. Mm. So I wrote my answer. 
four years later, I turned in my doctoral dissertation, the title of which was The Theory of Mental Activity in the Treatise of Human Nature and the Critique of Pure Reason. Three years after that, I published my first major article in the Philosophical Review, the title of which was Hume's Theory of Mental Activity. And three years after that, in 1963, I published my first book, Kant's Theory of Mental Activity. Now, as I have given, four years ago, I gave a series of nine lectures on the critique of pure reason, in which I set forth my interpretation of Kant, the interpretation that I had presented in my book. And with these lectures, I will bring that 69-year-old story to an end by setting forth my interpretation of book one of the Treatise of Human Nature. Just a word about David Hume. I won't go in great length into his biography, but if you're interested, there's a fine old biography by E.C. Mossner called David Hume, which you might want to take a look at. It's a splendid book. Hume was born in Edinburgh in 1711. He, he came actually from an aristocratic background, but he was a younger son, which meant that he didn't have much of an inheritance. At the age of 12, he was sent off to Edinburgh University. That was young, but not dramatically young. The typical age was about 14, I gather. And it was expected that he would study for the law, but instead he plunged into philosophy. And very early in his life, really when he was in his teens, he conceived the idea of writing a full-scale treatise of human nature. He worked very hard on this, so hard, in fact, that he injured his health and he went off to, to France to recover, where he completed this work. And in, and in 1739, at the age of 28, he published volumes one and two, books one and two of the treatise. And in 1740, he published book three. I should say, by the way, just by way, you'll discover if you follow these lectures that I am absolutely uncontrollably given to telling stories along with the philosophy, so I will have a shot at that. When I, when I was a graduate student, there was a game we used to play, which consisted of, it went like this, I'm not yet as old as X when he wrote Y. <laughs> the guy who was a real problem for us was, of course, George Barclay, who wrote The Principles of Human Knowledge when he was 21, which meant that by the time we started playing the game, we'd already lost it. <laughs> Our great favorites were Locke and Kant, who were in their late 50s when they wrote their great works. But Hume was a problem. He was 28 when he published the books one and two of the treatise. We weren't yet 28, but it was obvious we weren't going to make it by the time we were 28. At any rate, Hume published the treatise anonymously. Uh, that was not uncommon in his day and it bombed. It was a very unsuccessful publication. He wrote the following, a few months before his death in 1776, Hume wrote a, a short biograph, autobiographical sketch, and in it he wrote these words. He said, never literary attempt was more unfortunate than my treatise of human nature. It fell dead born from the presses, without reaching such distinction as even to excite a murmur among the zealots. If, if you're not familiar with obstetrical practices in the 18th century, I'll just explain the phrase, fell dead born from the, premise, from the presses. In the 18th century and at many other times in history, women delivered children not lying on their backs as is now the custom, but sitting in what was called a birthing chair. This was an armchair with no seat and the idea was to use the force of gravity to assist in the, in the birth process. As the fetus descended from the mother's womb, it was caught by the midwife underneath the chair. Like as not in those days, the birth was, was, un, was unsuccessful. The baby was born dead, in which case it was said to have fallen dead born. Mm -hmm. So this was the image that Hume was describing. He was not exaggerating, let me say. When I was writing my doctoral dissertation, I was guided, among other things, by a marvelous book on Hume by Norman Kemp Smith, whom you may know as the man who wrote also a very important commentary on the critique of pure reason. 
And guided by Smith, I wandered through the stacks of Widener Library at Harvard until I found a, a row of 18th century journals where I discovered reviews of Hume's book. Let me just read you what one of them said. I, I, I'm reading to you from my doctoral dissertation, of which I have, of course, the only copy in existence. Uh, this was from a journal called The History of the Works of the Learned. And the author of the review, which was also anonymous, by the way, had this to say about Hume's treatise. A man who has never had the pleasure of reading Mr. Locke's incomparable essay will peruse our author with much less disgust than those who have been used to the irresistible reasoning and wonderful perspicacity of that, of that admirable writer. And near the end of the review, he says, I have afore hinted the, the mighty value of this discovery. That is to say, the discovery that all our ideas are copied from our impressions. The honor of which, this reviewer says, is entirely due to our author, but it cannot be too often inculcated. I verily think if it were closely pursued, it would lead us to several inestimable desiderata, such as the perpetual motion, the grand elixir, a dissolvent of the stone, etc. Well, Hume was not thrilled with that review, as you can imagine. <laughs> and as a result, not too long after, actually only nine years later, he published, he started to publish two works which are much better known these days than the treatise, The Enquiries. In, in 1748, he published An Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding, <coughs> which was his rewriting of book one of the treatise. And in 1751, three years later, he published The Enquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals, which was his rewriting of books two and three. I am not going to talk about the inquiry concerning human understanding. I'm not going to do so because I am convinced, as I think Hume was too, although he wouldn't say so, that the treatise was far, by far the greater work. And I think it is there that we can find really exciting things happening which contradict the standard view about Hume's philosophy. Hume went on to do a good deal of other writing. The most famous thing he ever wrote, which made him rich and made him famous and became a bestseller in its day, was a six volume work called The History of England, which he published between 1754 and 1762. I've actually read this, I mean, as a, I pretend on occasion to be a scholar, and so I plowed through the six volumes of The History of England. It is by modern standards, a really dull history it's all names, dates, places, the doings of kings and wars and so forth. But in its day, it was the most important work that anybody had ever seen on the history of England. And it was a tremendous success. Went through, it was, went through many editions and so forth. It was not in, and not in the same league, of course, as that other great 18th century work by Gibbon, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. But it was a work which served as the standard history of England for a number of decades after, after Hume published it. One of the most interesting things that Hume published, wrote, was not published in his own lifetime. It was these dialogues concerning natural religion, which yeah, I'm sure many of you have read. Yeah. The dialogues are not in the same league as Plato's dialogues, which are incomparably the greatest dialogues ever written by a philosopher. But I think after, the, after Plato's dialogues, they are after that, the next best dialogues that have been written. They're worlds better than these rather pathetic dialogues that Spinoza wrote, and also the fragmentary dialogues we have written by Aristotle, who, God bless him, should not have attempted to imitate his great teacher. Mm -hmm. But the dialogues were so, I should explain the title for those of you who are not familiar with it. I suspect those of you present today in this lecture all know this, but I'm speaking also to an audience of YouTube uh, viewers who may be viewing this years from now and who may not know these things. In Western religious thought, there are two kinds of religion. There is natural religion and revealed religion. Natural religion is the set of truths which can which are presumably available to any human being by the use of his or her reason. 
Revealed religion is the set of special truths which have been revealed by God through revealed texts, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Koran. And these were dialogues on natural religion and more particularly a series of devastating critiques of the proofs for the existence of God. Hume wrote these, I think, in the 60s and 50, late 50s and 60s, but he showed them to his friends, including his good friend Adam Smith, who prevailed upon him not to publish them for fear that they would destroy his reputation. And so they died with him or they went to his, he didn't publish them and died. But three years later, his nephew published them posthumously in 1779. And those of you who haven't read them, I, I strongly recommend that you take a look at them. They are splendid. I should say one more word before I, I move on. I have actually held in my hands, in these two hands, Hume's own copy of the Treatise of Human Nature. I held it just for a brief moment, and when, when I realized what it was, I put it down and sent it back. I'll explain what happened. In 1964, my first wife and I were in England for the summer while she did research on her doctoral dissertation. And having nothing to do, I went to the British Museum, which is, of course, a great library. And I saw in the card catalog that they had an original an original treatise of human nature. And I thought, my God, an, a, an original publication, an original printing. So I set off for it. And I sat at the table in this great reading room until a, a librarian brought me my copy. And when I picked it up, I discovered that it was David Hume's own copy with his marginal emendations. I was so I was so terrified when I realized that that I put it down and called the I, I called the librarian over and said take this away please now, but I have held it in my hands. It was a magical moment. The treatise, as you may know, is in three books. Book one is called Of the Understanding. Book two is called Of the Passions. And book three is a call called Of Morals. It's book three that was published in 1740. These lectures will only deal with book one, and I will not try to bring them into connection with the inquiry concerning the human understanding, which I personally find an uninteresting work by comparison. This will be a deep look at the arguments in the treatise book one, and they will be an attempt for me finally for the ages, as it were, to lay before everybody the interpretation of that text that I launched 69 years ago as a young undergraduate at Harvard. Let me just, that's about, let me explain why I'm not going to go further today. Those of you who are watching in, in real time live, I'd like to give you the opportunity to read in advance the portion of the treatise that I will be discussing in the next lecture. Now, in my next lecture, a week from today, I'll be discussing part one of book one. Book one has four parts. I will be discussing part one. And so I want to give everybody the chance to read that or review it before I start talking about it. But let me just read you two brief passages from the introduction to the treatise uh, to set the stage. This is not my original copy. My original copy is now so beat up that I can scarcely turn the pages. But it is the same Selby Big edition of the treatise that is used by everybody these days with its unbelievable analytical index. If you read the analytical index, it's better than reading a, a series of journal articles on Hume. At any rate, here are these two passages from the preface, from the introduction, sorry. In the first one, Hume says this, "'Tis evident, that as you know if you've read Hume is one of his favorite phrases, "'Tis evident.'" It, he always says that just before he says something so not obvious that it blows your mind. He says, "'Tis evident that all the sciences have a relation greater or less to human nature and that however wide any of them may seem to run from it, they will return back by one passage or another. 
even mathematics, natural philosophy, and natural religion are in some measure dependent on the science of man. Since they be under the cognizance of men, man and are judged by their powers and faculties, it is impossible to tell what changes and improvements we might make in these sciences were we thoroughly acquainted with the extent and force of human understanding and could explain the nature of the ideas we employ and of the operations we perform in our reasonings. And then on the next page, he continues very briefly. And as the science of man is the only solid foundation for the other sciences, so the only solid foundation we can give to this science itself must be laid on experience and observation. And with that, we have the classic statement of 18th century empiricism. Before I stop, I just want to say a word about what was going on here in philosophically in the history of philosophy. For the first 2000 years or more, philosophy was concerned primarily with the big questions of the existence of God, the nature of being, the structure of the universe, necessity, possibility, and so forth. Questions which we have come to call metaphysical. Calling them metaphysical, by the way, is just an historical accident. I don't know how many of you know this odd story. Yeah. There was an, Aristotle called these issues questions of first philosophy. And he thought that they were the most important. And in addition to writing the Nicomachean Ethics and De Anima and the Physics, he also wrote a series of essays on first philosophy. Well, in an early edition of the complete works of Aristotle, these essays on first philosophy appeared in that edition after the physics. They were in Greek, ta meta ta physica. And so this, they came to be called the metaphysics because they came not, they weren't higher than metaphysics. They weren't superior to metaphysics. They just came after the physics in the series of works. Mm -hmm. and so they came to be called metaphysics. And for 2000 years, questions of metaphysics took priority in the works of almost all philosophers over questions of human knowledge. Well, in the early 18th century, that all changed dramatically. And oddly enough, the change began in a work by Descartes, which was called Meditations on First Philosophy. But although it was called Meditations on First Philosophy, it completely reversed the order of priority and importance of first philosophy and human knowledge. And that's why in the 18th and 19th centuries, we get a series of works with titles like Essay Concerning the Human Understanding, Principles of Human Knowledge, Treatise of Human Nature, Critique of Pure Reason. All of them works which announce by their titles that they are about the human capacity for knowledge, not about the universe or about mm -hmm. being or about God or substance. And Hume was very much of this, of this, uh, of this reversal. This came to be called the epistemological turn, epistemology being a $10 word for theory of knowledge. And that epistemological turn dominated philosophy very much until a new turn took place in the 20th century, the so-called linguistic turn, which substituted questions of language for questions of human knowledge on the grounds that all language is expressed in, all knowledge is expressed in language and therefore we must first understand the nature of language before we can understand the nature of knowledge. That's, that's the tradition that I grew up with as a student. And indeed in those days, it was standard operating procedure for departments to offer a course on the British empiricists and a course on the continental rationalists and to play this relationship between the two. But these two contrasting views were all part of the epistemological turn. They were just two different views on what the sources and foundation of human knowledge were. And in that great tradition, I think it's fair to say, well, I'm showing my prejudices, that the two greatest works were Hume's Treatise of Human Nature and Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. Some people would argue that Locke belongs ahead of Hume, I won't debate that matter, but clearly Hume's treatise is one of the major works in this modern 18th, 19th 
and 20th century transformation of the nature of philosophy. Now, that's all I'm going to say about these matters today. That I've only talked for 25 minutes. I'm not going to launch into the treatise yet because beyond the introduction, because I want you to have the chance to read it. But starting next Saturday, we will look closely at the arguments of part one of the treatise. And we will continue on. I should say, I have almost nothing to say about part two, which is a total flop philosophically in my judgment. Part three is the most famous part. It's where you get the critique of causal inference. But I think ac actually even more exciting than part three is part four. So in all likelihood, there will be three or four more lectures and that will wrap things up. And then I can go back to trying to determine whether I have to wear a mask when I go outside and whether the food that is delivered to my doorstep at my retirement community has to be desanitized before I can bring it inside. These are the issues that are really pressing at this moment. Although, of course, I don't suspect that they will be very pressing to people who watch these lectures three or four years from now. Well, I gather the, you are all live. So if anyone has comments or questions, now's the time. Yes. Go ahead. John? Oh, hi. Yes. Thank you, Professor Wolf. Uh, I'd like uh, to ask you to say a few words about the Newtonian uh, dimension of Hume's project as, uh, as he presents it in the uh, preface, please. I'm if gonna, you think that would be appropriate. I'm going to save that for next time. I'm going to talk next time about there's a, there's a passage, a critical moment where Hume uh, introduces the Newtonian element, and I want to save my comments for that. But he was very profoundly influenced, obviously, by both Locke's essay and by Newton. Newton was the the gold standard for scientific investigation in his day, of course. And just to give you a hint of where we're going, the gentle force of association, as Hume calls it, is his version of Newton's force of gravitation. And that raises a very interesting philosoph series of philosophical questions, which I will talk about next time. Hmm. All right. Thank you very much. I'll look okay. forward to it. Okay. Anybody else? This is your big chance. You can ask about anything. <laughs> I have a comment, however. Sure. Um, about the game you used to play. Yes. Uh, toward philosophers. Uh, Victor Borga used to talk about uh, himself as a, mu he's a fine musician, also a very funny guy. Yes. And, and he had a line that when Mozart was my age, he had been dead for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, in music, it, it, as in mathematics, I mean, if you're old enough to ask the question in mathematics, you're obviously over you're, the hill. You're too old. <laughs> and I mean, anybody, I mean, my favorite, one of my all-time favorite movies is Amadeus. Mm -hmm. I have this fantasy, which I've had for a long time, that I, that I somehow am able to travel back in time. And there are two things that I dream of doing. One is to go back to England in the 18th century and to find Hume and tell him, it's all right, David, we know how great the treatise of Hume nature is. It's the greatest <laughs> work of philosophy written in English. Honest engine, we know. The other is was based on the movie Amadeus, which I'm sure many of you have seen. And I want to go back to the court of the Emperor Joseph, who is all full of himself and say, we all remember you in the 21st century. And he pumps himself up and he says, we remember you because that funny little man in the corner there was in your court, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. I have those. Those are the daydreams I have as I take my morning walk. But Victor Borgo, I, I knew that Victor Borgo was a for real musician as well as being very funny. Wonderful pianist. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's it, I will figure out how to bring this session to a close.
and I will look forward to seeing all of you or as many of you as decide to return a week from today when we will start a serious look at Hume's Treatise of Human Nature. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.